so yes, today I'm talking about APA descriptions and uh, using them as production code. It's kind of a new thing. I figured all the, uh, a lot of this stuff out while I was working at WeWork. You might have heard of them in the news recently. Um, I'm, very glad, <laughs> I'm very glad to say they're my previous employer. Um, while I was at WeWork, I, I joined WeWork because uh, one of my friends was working there and he said, all of our APIs are terrible, please come and help. So I did. Um, on day one I got there and said, right, where are your APA documentation? And they said, what? <laughs> so that was fun. Um, since then, uh, that was a very stressful kind of two years, and I ended up cycling around the world to calm down a little bit. Um, and <laughs> then I managed to injure my foot by cycling all of Denmark in 24 hours, so I've been hanging out in Amsterdam for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so during 2017 and 18, there was a lot of questions that were coming up, and these are questions that you've probably been asking yourselves. Uh, the first one being design first or code first. Uh, some other stuff, you know, what tooling supports OpenAPI v3? Not Swagger, it's been OpenAPI since 2016. But what, what, um, there's two of us in the room that care about that. Um, <laughs> so we're trying to figure out what tooling supported the latest version. We're also wondering why there's no editors out there. There's some that were bad, but not really anything that was usable. How and when do we create documentation, right? When do we create mocks? And how can we enforce style guides for documentation so that we don't, uh, like Alvaro was saying, have to have kind of open API gatekeepers keeping an eye on everything that comes through. And the biggest question, which is the majority of this talk, is how do we keep code and docs in sync? Right? Put your hands up if you've had this problem. Probably everyone, right? It's a solved problem. Listen in. Uh, so the easiest one to, uh, to answer is what tooling supports open API v3? The answer is most of it now. It's fine. Like, tools have caught up. I made this website, openapi.tools, and it's got a list of tools on there. Got a, a pull request from Lorna Mitchell, making it much nicer. Um, and yes, uh, use that website to find modern stuff. If it's not on there, it's because it's either bad, or it only supports OpenAPI v2, which is old. So there you go. They're all little green ticks next to v3. So while I was at WeWork, I came up with this workflow, which is very similar to what the folks from Salesforce were just saying. Um, you don't necessarily need to read this, it's obviously very zoomed out, but we were trying to find out, uh, I love the term from Kelly, uh, Doc Ops, I've never heard that term before. Uh, I basically became Doc Ops at WeWork because um, we wanted to be able to aggregate all of our documentation into a hub, and we wanted to have docs and mocks and SDKs and all of the good things. A lot of those things were designed to get people writing the documentation. The developers didn't want to, it was extra work. Um, so when I said, oh, if you, uh, if you do this, then we can automatically mirror to a Postman collection, they were like, ooh, that sounds fun. So I set up a whole bunch of carrots and a couple of sticks to try and get people writing documentation. Contract testing was one of them, a bunch of other things. But the problem was, all of the tooling vendors in the space, um, you know, Stoplight, Apogee, Apiary, a lot of the stuff would kind of lock you into a walled garden. So if you wanted to maintain full control over your API descriptions, um, and also like have them in with your code, you were kind of stuffed there. Um, so I ended up talking with a lot of the vendors, and one of them was Stoplight, um, and they were helping us work on trying to get access to, a, to an editor, right? Like I, had, I came up with this whole workflow of all of these cool things you could do, and the first thing was write open API, and it was by hand <laughs> in YAML, which no one enjoys doing. Um, so I was bugging Stoplight a whole bunch, and in the end we figured it would just be easier if I worked there, so that's where I work now. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing, which is a little bit harder to answer, is design first or code first? Um, if you're doing code first, if you're lucky, people start using annotations. If you're in a, a, a language like Java that has um, annotations as a first class feature, then this is a little bit better because you get kind of syntax highlighting, you can check to see if things are actually right. But if you're in PHP, which doesn't have annotations, or a lot of other languages that don't, you just have this nonsense pile of garbage at the top, and it's not exactly a great way to handle things. Um, the argument for uh, using annotations like this is often, if we put the uh, description near the contents, then theoretically, most, of, most developers will keep it up to date, and that's a lot of ifs and buts, right? Uh, I like this, this quote. Um, <laughs> Code comments are just facts waiting to become lies, um, or a visual representation if you're visually minded. <laughs> Takes a second. So this one is basically what I got to at WeWork. Um, this diagram is the entire flow, right? So you, you plan it somehow on a napkin or on a whiteboard or something, who knows, 
and then you share that napkin around and see what people think, and then you write a bunch of code, give that prototype to the customer, um, see what the customer <laughs> thinks, but, and then like, we need to rewrite a bunch of code, so damn, all right, give us a week or two. Um, then eventually, hopefully, they, they, you know, the deadlines run out, they have no more time for feedback, because uh, it's taking you a week to implement each round. So you just deploy it, and then you think, oh, we'll write the documentation later, but you don't, because you're busy, and there's new customers turn up, and then everyone's forgotten how it works, because, and the documentation's so bad. So the developers try reading the code to figure out what worked, but it's just such bad code, because you have like, gone through such backflips trying to not break the API, implementing all this feedback that you've had from customers, so you end up just throwing it out and starting again. Um, who's been through this workflow? Yeah, right, like a lot of people. <laughs> so this is the um, code first, then we'll write docs when we have time workflow, which is nonsense. There's a slight improvement on this using uh, annotations, which is we will code first, we'll bang annotations in there, we'll get feedback. You still have this slow feedback loop where you're sharing the documentation because you have the annotations to be able to do it, but the, cu the customer feedback is coming a little bit late. You've already written the code before you're getting the feedback, so if you want to change anything, you have to change your code and rewrite everything, which is just wasted time and money. Um, the benefit of this over the last approach is that because you are you know, putting that stuff in with your, your uh, actual code, theoretically it's probably mostly right, and it's evolving as time goes on, so you don't have to change your workflow too much. The alternative to code first, either of those two variations, is design first, and this is starting to get a bit more popular, but this, this exact branch of it still kind of sucks. Um, what happens here is people start designing with OpenAPI, maybe using a DSL or using an editor like Stoplight Studio. Um, you get mocks and docs straight away, um, uh, me, uh, and you get customer feedback pretty early on. You just get mocks and docs, you tweak the YAML, job done. Um, but the problem here is that at some point it, it assumes that the design phase is done, right? Like the design of the API is never really done. Um, you deploy version one if you're versioning and then you know, two is going to come later. If you're using evolution, you're going to add new endpoints and new features and new properties, right? So th this kind of assumes that you can export from your editor and import into something else and then that's it forever. Um, so then you're kind of left going with uh, code first again, right? Maybe the annotations flavor of code first. Not great. So, this is what I recommend. Uh, this should be a circle, really, but I'm not too great at diagrams. Um, basically, you design it in the same way, you get mocks and docs in the same way, you get customer feedback in the same way, and then uh, you actually use the open API files, or description documents, as we're starting to call them. Uh, you use those files in your production code to make your production code much, much, much easier, um, and you use them for testing and everything else. Then you deploy all of that stuff together, and when people ask for new functionality, it really is back to the start. You're, you're in a consistent feedback cycle where if a new endpoint is being developed, you just you know, mock and dock that new endpoint, and people can play around with that without you having to start from scratch or just code and hope that it's right. A real life cycle is more like this. I'm not going through this, but like <laughs> I'm talking about a subsection of this. This is a great article. These slides are also available online, phil.tech slash speaking, if you want to grab them. So this is another good point, right? Uh, open API is great, but writing it by hand sucks, basically. <laughs> who agree? Actually, who enjoys writing YAML by hand? I know for some people accessibility is an issue. We got, we got two brave souls, fair play, sir. Uh, <laughs> so the, this brings us on to the next question. Why are there no editors? Well, there is now. Great. Studio. We made it. It's awesome. Um, it's, it's a GUI. You can do things in text if you want. You can do it you know, using the GUI if you want. Uh, supports Open API 2 and 3. It works with a local file system, so you can commit things to Git or do whatever you want. It's totally free as well, so you don't have to pay us for anything, but there's some cool stuff you can pay for. Um, it supports really complicated stuff, like all of and any of, which most people don't understand even how it works, but there's a GUI for it now, so yay. Um, it also supports refs, and you can have a common library of like shared things between different APIs, which is really fun. Um, and we'll start sharing them across the organization once we have, have a few more advanced features in there. It also works with Markdown, so you can mix and match open API definitions and uh, Markdown. So you can, you can have like how-to tutorial guides, as well as your like, very, um, very nerdy kind of API reference stuff, all sat next to each other and linking to each other. Uh, when do we create documentation? Well, this, we solved it as well. Um, you can be in Studio and just click Publish, and then you have your docs online. Uh, do that whenever you want, 
or you can run it from the CLI, from the um, from your continuous integration. You have a thing that just publishes it when you merge stuff to master. So job done. Looks pretty. When do you create mocks? Guess what? We solved it. It's built right in the studio. Um, you just have a studio. Uh, you have a, a mock server running while you're working on stuff. So all the developers that are designing the API right away have uh, access to it. And I'm currently figuring out the mocking server uh, online. Two. So the main question we're still at uh, is how do we keep stuff in sync? And I think that is the wrong question to be asking. Uh, don't think of it as code and documentation. Uh, we're not really talking about documentation. I mean, I know I'm at API the docs right now, but documentation is just a rendering of your description files. It's one possible output of those files that should be used for 100 different things. So really you want to talk about how can you use the API descriptions to simplify your code. And the reason for this is if you get developers excited about writing these things, they will. And then docs, like they're, they're doing the documentation work for you. The docs, you just kind of spit them out afterwards. Um, but you get the developers working on this stuff for good reasons. Now, not talking about code generation. That is really fun and really cool stuff, but it's a different talk. Um, code generation is when you like, build an entire server out of the, the definitions, and I've seen it done successfully. Really what I'm talking about is this situation where you have the code for the API and you have the reference documentation. So somebody builds the API and then they're saying, here's a bunch of validation rules, and then you build the documentation that says, yeah, this is, this is the rules, and you're then trying to figure out how to keep those two things in sync, right? The server-side validation, maybe it lives in the model, and then you've got a bunch of like weird logic and regexes in your data layer, which isn't great. Maybe it lives in the controller, which might be okay, but if you have multiple controllers that accept the same sort of resource, then you're copying and pasting logic. Maybe you're just mad and <laughs> put it in the view. I've, I've seen these animals do it. Maybe it lives in some sort, of, some sort of shared service, or maybe it lives in a contract, which is a, a different type of shared file. Right? In Ruby, it looks like this. Any Ruby developers in the house? One? All right. All right. Two of us. Mm. So in Ruby, it looks a bit like this. You have a whole bunch of code, and you're basically defining what your contract is. A uh, big old chunk of regex there trying to figure out email. Great. In JavaScript, this actually doesn't look so bad, but this is because it's the only example I could find uh, that would fit on the screen. <laughs> so most implementations aren't as, as simple as this, um, but you're creating, the, the API developers are creating this thing, and again, it's just a copy of what you have in your open API or JSON schema, it's the same thing. So why would you have the same stuff in two different places? Having multiple sources of truth just means you need to make sure that those two sources of truth aren't contradicting each other, and that's a massive waste of time. Dread aims to solve that, but I have had a lot of experience with Dread, and it's often more trouble than it's worth. Does anyone here use Dread? It's a very intelligent tool which will basically look through your OpenAPI or APA Blueprint files, and then it tries to create an example request based off of the examples and the data types, and it throws them at a, an instance of your API. It could be a QA environment or a local host in your test suite. And then it basically says, well, the data I've got back, I was expecting a string, but that was an integer. What's going on there, right? So it's kind of contract testing, but also mostly just checking that your documentation isn't wrong. But the problem is it, uh, it mutates state throughout the entire test suite. So if you delete something and then try and get it in the next test, you can. Um, you can sort things. There's a bunch of like hacks and workarounds. But in my experience, people get so fed up with trying to make Dread work, they just disable it, and then your docs are wrong. So I, I don't recommend it. Instead, has anyone ever tried using uh, OpenAPI to implement uh, server-side validation? No, one, one person. OK, great. So this thing is awesome. Um, if you're using, uh, there's a lot of Ruby examples here, and I'm sorry about that, but it's a generic con uh, concept. You can uh, pass in an OpenAPI file to a middleware in the API, and one line of code in your setup adds validation to every single endpoint that you have. Because whenever a request comes in, it will say, okay, I know what URL, I know what method, I know all of, the, all of the schema, what should be expected in this request body, I know what parameters to expect, and it can throw an error when that doesn't work, right? Who thinks that sounds pretty cool? No, fine, what? <laughs> I'll just leave. <laughs> so this, it's in all the languages, um, and, and this is really helpful. Like, you can just implement these middlewares, and all of a sudden your developers didn't have to write that much code. They still have full control over the code that they're writing, but they haven't, you know, so it's not like server generation, where you have this weird artifact that you're scared to change. Um, you can just, you don't have to like, write out all of that stuff again. 
And if you're using like a standard error format, like RFC 7807, I should have memorized that one, I'm very proud of myself, um, you will get these consistent errors in this format. You can change the format, it doesn't matter. So now it looks a bit more like this. You have a description document which says what the rules are, you have a single source of truth, your code references that source of truth, and your documentation is just a rendering of that same thing. Which means if you've got code, you can delete it. If you have a legacy uh, project, you can just make it simpler. Uh, if you're building a new application, you don't have to waste time building all of that validation code. That makes your code way easier. That saves time and saves money. And honestly, it's boring. Now, whenever I talk about this stuff, someone says, well, you can't check and see if an email is unique, right? Obviously, you can't do that in a Swagger file. There are going to be some rules that you do need to hit the database for, and that's fine because you have to write 5% of the validation logic that you did before. As long as your validation errors are in the same format, no one knows whether it came from the description document uh, middleware or from your code. It's just errors happening. Uh, and then another cool thing, that handles the requests, right? But for your... Um, for your responses, you want to make sure that they're correct too. And so you can use a little bit of code like this. Has anyone seen like JSON schema matches, any sort of assertion library in their test suite? So instead of having something like Dread, you just use the, uh, use the description documents as a contract testing tool, and you just say, hey, this should match an instance of user. This makes testing much, much easier, because in the past, I've written all those giant tests where you're like, and make sure that email is a string, and make sure that this field is this thing, and you have this massive long test in every single uh, request just to make sure that your contract is, is correct. And as you can see, a pattern here is your, your contract doesn't need to be in 25 different places. It can be in one place and reused for everything. Now, another common uh, concern is people say, well, having an open API uh, validation middleware sounds like it's not going to be performant, right? It sounds like it's going to be slow and, and fluffy and hard to debug, but you can use them at the gateway level. Um, they can, uh, the gateway is usually written in something like Lua or Go or something that may well be a lot more performant than whatever you're writing in. And so you can use them to basically stop your application server being bothered with a request that's not valid. So if you look here, I love me some sequence diagrams. Uh, request comes in and then validation says nope. Uh, oh no, sorry, validation says yes, goes off the API server and then responds and the person gets that response. But down here, the request fails. So your API server didn't have to waste time going, that's not a valid email address. It could do something more useful like accept a payment. Um, so leave your servers alone if you don't need to. A bunch of them support it AWS, Azure, Express, and Tyke uh, all offer some level of support for this concept. You can mix and match. So uh, people say, you know, having a gateway enforced validation sounds confusing, but seeing as they're based on standards and they have standard error outputs, you can have a gateway in prod and you can have a, a middleware in dev. And theoretically, you should have dev prod parity. Who knows? <coughs> there is a third source of truth, and this one's super scary. Has anyone come across a situation where the clients are validating things differently to the server? This is super fun. Um, or when you have different servers validating different things, you have a two-way sync and they both reject based on different problems. Um, so the server's saying, I'm totally fine with you sending me a name that's 20 characters long. And so the clients copy and paste that from your documentation and write it in their code. The clients are doing that because they want real-time validation on their shiny UI, right? But what happens when the API... The API developers sat down and said, we actually want to create, uh, to make it so that people can have longer names, right? They spoke to a German, realized those names are long, and went, 40 characters is better than 20. So this is fine until one of the clients updates their thing. And then you screw because the, the web app developer, um, if somebody's using the web app and they put in their German name and they use up all 40 characters, then that goes back to the, uh, the API server, great. And then when they try and do it on the mobile app, one or two things is going to happen. They're either going to get their name truncated because it's not going to fit in the text box, or uh, it's going to put the whole thing in the text box and then like, fail to send it back. So they'll be like, hang on a minute, this was valid a minute ago. It's already on the server. Why is it suddenly invalid? So again, multiple sources of truth causing problems for everyone. What you could do is have your clients look at the JSON schema, which you've published online. These are just the models from your open API stuff. And then you have that. There's a bunch of code out there that helps people validate stuff. In JavaScript, it looks like this. So if you imagine that the cached schema, you just downloaded that over the URL. Uh, you have a function that says validate, either say true, or give me some errors. And then you pass in some information, pretend that came from a form, right? 
Then, when you validate it, it says true. And if you pass in some nonsense, one, two, three, it doesn't seem like a very valid email address. If you pass that in, it will give you an error. And you've got data path and schema path, so you can look at the actual data in a complex object to find the exact piece that went wrong. You can look at the schema path to load up the exact properties that you should be abiding to. And it'll even show you like the specific bit that failed and give you a text version. So you can stitch all that stuff together and make quite a nice array of human readable errors. Um, this was a couple of lines of code. It's really not hard to do. It even, like, if you, if you define a format, it will give you that format back and say you should have matched this date format. And you can use this for internationalization too. So the last bit is how do we enforce style guides for docs? Uh, now, uh, Alvaro was just talking about this, and, and most, of you have been, uh, most of the speakers today have been talking about this. It's a giant pain. You come up with some uh, like style guide. I've done it before. We had a wiki, and we're like, you should use Pascal case for your schema names, and you should use hyphens for your URLs, and you should always make sure you have tags with, they should be in alphabetical order, and you have all this stuff in there. Um, and people forget to go and read the, the word doc, and maybe they read it, and even if they do memorize it completely perfectly, if you add a new rule, they're not going to know about it. So you need to employ like open API gatekeepers, and their entire job is to like read every pull request and try not to get depressed about doing that all day, every day. Um, and so we made a tool for that, Spectral. Um, you can automate it. It runs on JavaScript. It, it's a CLI tool. It's uh, put it in continuous integration. Bop it, twist it, do what you want. Um, there's even a GitHub action and a GitHub bot, which we're uh, releasing soon. So it's available in all the ways. And what you can do with it, it's got a bunch of built-in open API rules, a bunch of like just sensible uh, raw rules, and it does validation. But beyond validation, it helps make sure that your open API specifications are like useful, not just technically correct, but like are they useful? Do they have enough information in there? And if you want, you can create custom rule sets that extend or replace those rules. So right here, I made this rule up the other day, uh, just using a bit of yum. And it says schema names should be in Pascal case. Um, then a human readable description. We recommend that you use this. Given is a JSON uh, JSON path. So you basically look at the exact right bit of the open API file. Um, this works with RAML too, anything that's JSON or YAML based. Um, and yeah, then it enforces a regex. Love me some regex. So what this does, if somebody puts in a, uh, a schema name that is not uh, Pascal case, it gives them, give them some errors. And these errors show up, uh, they show up in Stoplight Studio. We've got it built in. So while you're writing stuff, um, especially if you're using uh, the design first approach, we're actually giving you feedback on the <coughs> the schema like, that you're writing on the, the meta uh, document that you're writing, they're actually giving you feedback on the contents as well. So if your URLs have a funny looking name, they'll give you uh, advice on that. And so what it means is that before an API even exists, it basically has to be valid because you've, you've got these rules in there. You can even do some really interesting things like copying and pasting these rules around, sounds like a mess, um, but you can extend over the URL or from local files. So you can have whatever your company is, .com slash style guide, you know, call it whatever you want. And if every single API does that, just like you know, um, ESLint or whatever, then it means that everybody gets those rules. And like I said, you can, you can run this in, your, uh, in, in Stoplight Studio. It's built in. Uh, we're working on a VS Code extension. It'll hopefully be out soon. Um, you can run it on the CLI. We've got a few different formatting options. Uh, put it in a GitHub so people literally cannot commit if their stuff is rubbish. Uh, we've got it on continuous integration, uh, so we've even got like JUnit support, so you get beautiful uh, output of, of where everything is. Um, and yeah, there's a GitHub action that I forgot to mention, so you just like three lines and you just have it built into GitHub if you've passed the beta period. Um, so shouldn't need to say too much on this, that like consistent APIs save a bunch of time and money. Um, if you're writing a bunch of documentation and all of your APIs are totally different, you've got to put extra time and effort into explaining all of the weird little bits um, and, it, and it sucks for your clients too, they're all super different, that's no fun. So um, yeah, make things consistent before they even exist instead of trying to fix it later. Um, if after you've deployed your API, you're like, oh, we should have used hyphens instead of underscores, but we've got 20 clients, uh, that's not great. So <laughs> um, all of this and more is in blog form on, um, on apiswonthate.com. Um, you can subscribe to the podcast, there is a Slack, uh, and yeah, stoplight.io is where you can find the tools. Uh, thank you very much.